Okay, so this is the last day and we have uh, Dr. Vishwesh Guttal, the ecologist in Center for Ecological Sciences in the Indi Indian Institute of Science is one of the organizers, Vishu, myself and Shrikanth. So Shrikanth, uh, sorry, Vishu works on uh, critical transitions. We've been working on a this paper, uh, not this paper, a paper related to this in application in finance since 2012 and I mean that's one of the initiator of these ideas to create something like a winter school. I hope you'll find this useful and thanks Vishu. Okay, great. Uh, thanks Raghav. And uh, so I know you're all probably really um, sick and tired of us by now. So I will try to, um, you know, make sure we, we have a fairly easy session today. And uh, there was some request uh, because many of you are probably flying in the afternoon or taking trains in the afternoon to finish by lunch time. So most likely we may even do that. So, you know, I'll try to go a little fast so that by lunch time, which we'll just wrap up the entire uh, school. Is that, is that a good idea? Okay. Um, great idea. <laughs> okay. So that's the plan. So um, to sort of very briefly, does it work? very briefly uh, motivate um, the work that I do uh, that I'm going to present today. Uh, so look at these two sort of uh, graphs. The one on the right hand side is a lot more familiar to you uh, where you see the Dow Jones index sort of in a, uh, in a uh, you know, in a massive growth curve in a bullish face uh, just before the crash um, in 1929 sometime in October. Oh, is the mic not uh, loud enough? Okay. Should I keep it maybe on the collar? Yeah. Huh? Is it better now? Okay. Um, so, um, so this is something not more familiar to you. Uh, the one on the left hand side is a uh, similar event of a large scale change that happened in an ecosystem. And um, so what you are seeing there on the top I'm sure all of you recognize that as you know Northern Africa, right? Sahara um, Desert. Uh, but the Sahara Desert wasn't like this throughout the history. So in fact, um, if you if you go back in time, so if we so what this zero represents is today, and if we go back in time, so this is ten thousand years before the present. So roughly around 5,000 years before the present, uh, what this graph is telling you is that the entire composition of the Sahara sort of underwent an abrupt change. Okay, in fact, it was uh, it was it is said to be you know highly vegetated. Um, it had large megafauna that was you know roaming around uh, as recent as around 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. And uh, what is really interesting is the fact that this massive change actually happened for a relatively um, uh, no significant changes in the external drivers. So this was a large scale uh, change in the entire continent, right? Uh, in the ecosystem of the continent. And one of the key drivers of these, uh, uh, you know, changes is actually rainfall and the overall climatic conditions. And, uh, and uh, in particular, the one, the thing that really drives the monsoon in this area is actually the, the, the way earth is tilted. So depending on, I, 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 I'm assuming some of you would know that the earth has a small precision around the axis. Not only does it go around the sun and it rot, you know, revolves, uh, you know, just you know, rotates on its own, it also has a small precision on, around its axis. And that has a time scale of around 18,000 years or so. And what, what's very interesting is if you go back in time, there was another similar event some 18 to 20,000 years ago, where it was again in a similar state. And what is interesting is that the driver, which is the solar radiation on the uh, African continent, is changing periodically, very gradually. There are no abrupt changes in the driver itself, but the system itself responds in a highly nonlinear fashion. Okay, and those are called abrupt transitions. And uh, and this is a very this is an example of really large scale event. Uh, but these also can happen. Uh, in many small scale systems and the characteristics of these transitions are that 
you find an abrupt and persistent change in the state of a system okay and uh, they are often driven by gradual changes it is not as if that the driver itself underwent a massive change because of which the system underwent a massive change which would be sort of expected right you know if something dramatic happens outside it will have a consequence on everything that is dependent on it but many of these transitions abrupt transitions are driven by gradual changes in drivers uh, which makes them very hard to predict you know you know you know f you know that makes it you know when when do these kind of events occur uh, it therefore becomes a very important question a difficult question to answer and they also exhibit hysteresis how many of you understand by this term hysteresis if you saw the cusp catastrophe bifurcation diagram um, uh, do I need I will, I will maybe show this uh, a bit later hysteresis basically means that Imagine a driver change because of a system collapsed. If I change the driver back, it won't trace the same path. Okay, it actually gets stuck in something else. So now I will explain to you how something like that can happen um, uh, in, a, in a while. And uh, these are not only documented in those large scale shifts. The reason why ecologists are interested in this is, uh, you know, uh, they also happen on much smaller scales and much smaller time scales. Uh, such as in lakes, you know, algal blooms in lakes is something you may have heard of. And you know, coral reef bleaching, and actually this year, there's going to be a, you know, a massive expectation of coral reef bleaching because of El Nino. And what is interesting is the temperature actually doesn't change, change too much, you know, it only changes by half a degree or so. Uh, but you know, in that small range, the entire uh, reef systems respond highly non-linearly. Okay. And uh, desertification uh, uh, that I showed you on a large scale can also happen on much smaller scales. Uh, so all these things make us wonder, is there some way we can anticipate these kind of abrupt changes? So what do I mean by that? So let us look at this graph or this Dow Jones graph. Now this was the time when something suddenly went wrong, right? And likewise, this was something suddenly some collapse happened. Now if I had, if I were somewhere on this trajectory, okay, somewhere on this trajectory, is there something that's hidden inside this data over time in the dynamics that could, you know, uh, help us anticipate a potential abrupt transition? Okay. Uh, in other words, are there early warning signal that can be, you know, detected before a transition actually happens? Uh, and that's one question we are going to address today. Perhaps even more important might be. Can we actually predict when this event will exactly happen? Uh, of course, that may be, in, you know, inherently impossible given the stochasticity of the systems. But one can still ask: Are there certain parameter values uh, we can parameterize uh, to know when exactly these events happen? Okay. So that's the that's the basic goal of today. Uh, we will not do this today because it's not actually not it's actually not possible. Uh, we will only focus on this question today. And to do that, I will go back to what I sort of briefly discussed. On Thursday morning, and then I will use some of the techniques that you know uh, Petri has taught you yesterday, and then I will, and then some techniques that Srikanth has taught you on a Tuesday or Monday or Tuesday, and then I sort of try to bring them all together, and then hopefully make sense of how to devise early warning signals. And once we do that, we will try to run the package and try to verify if any of those are true in uh, you know this data. So that's our you know grand goal for today. Uh, hopefully by lunch time okay so i can actually i can uh, i don't need the slides anymore we can remove them any questions on the motivation and what we aim to achieve today okay um mm -hmm. what is eutrophication in lakes um lakes have you seen lakes in bangalore or kolkata or somewhere they're really in bad condition right so they're all highly eutrophied lakes meaning they have mass really large uh, nutrient contents so large nutrients are good right nutrients nutrients are great except that if the nutrients are just too 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 much a lot of fish can't survive a lot of uh, you know uh, you know macrophytic plants also can't survive they all die and the only thing that survives are these, you know, all some certain type species of algae. And that leads, in fact, so what really happens is as a function of the nutrient inputs, if you measure the algal density, it sort of increases non-linearly. Okay. 
and uh, you can also measure much simpler quantity like turbidity in the water, clarity in the water. You know, even that, you know, a very, very highly clear water means there are no nutrients in them. So that means again, you won't have any uh, living organisms. But if we have an intermediate one, that's fantastic for large number of species. But if you increase it, you know, uh, beyond some threshold value, lot, you know, this algae just entirely overtake and everything else sort of disappear. So that state of high nutrient conditions with large amount of algae and uh, that bit water conditions would be called a eutrophite lake. The opposite of that is called oligotrophic lake. Oligotroph, O L I G O T R O F I C. Okay, great. So let me just make sure a few points that I want to make. Okay, so one of the first things we did, uh, where should I stop writing here? Here? Is this good enough? Okay. So, so all of us know this. A simple um, uh, proportion, properly, you know, some any quantity that's changing proportional to the current density. If R is positive, then what we have is an exponential growth, right? And uh, the simple, you know, again R greater than zero. So R greater than zero, it means the coefficient is on negative. If you have a negative a negative growth rate, what do you have? You have an exponential decay. The system decays, sorry, sorry, this is plus, this is minus. The system decays back to zero uh, exponentially fast. So if R is the growth rate here, what would be a good interpretation for R in this case? So just look at this equation. You have xt is equal to x0 e power minus rt, right? Um, what is the unit of R? So R is, R has a unit of 1 over time, right? So 1 over R has a unit of time, okay? So uh, basically we can, we can think of R as return rate to okay? So we can think of this parameter R as the return rate to equilibrium. And, uh, and one thing that probably is clear to all of you from yesterday's lectures is that it does not matter how complex the entire um, rate equation is. Okay? Uh, when you linearize the system around the equilibrium, it always looks in one of these forms. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So some of you can't see. You can also try to come in the front actually. Uh, but I will try to write big. Okay. Uh, okay. So, why this is so important is that whenever you do simple stability analysis, you are effectively relying on these two factors. Okay. And whenever and, and uh, the system reaches back the equilibrium if the coefficient is negative. Okay. That is the basic uh, idea. Okay. So, all of you know this. And if we had a more complex equation, you know, x star is equal to f of x, um, and it doesn't have to be a simple linear function. So we find the equilibria by what? By this simple condition, right? f of x star is equal to zero. All the x stars, such that the f reaches, if whenever f crosses the you know x-axis, they are the equilibria. And uh, how do you find the stability of an equilibria? So you take the same function. Evaluate the derivative at the equilibrium point, and this actually is same as this coefficient r in the linear approximation. Therefore, if this is less than zero, we have a stable equilibria. So I'm just recapping what you already know, by the way. So I hope a little bit of repetition doesn't hurt. Okay. So in fact, the first half an hour is largely going to be repetition of what we have, what you have learnt. Maybe using slightly different language. Okay. So these are the conditions for stability. Can I write here? Can everybody see here? Okay. So and then I did one more thing, which is define a potential. So we defined a potential u of x as negative integral of this rate function. So 
So you take the same function f, integrate this from x0, some constant number, to a variable x, okay? And this we call potential. And what we showed um, on Thursday's class was that du by dt is always less than 0, okay? Because of which, if I were to plot, huh? Yes. Okay. So u of x of t is less than 0. And because of which, if you plot u of x as a function of x, the x is changing over time given by this equation. Therefore, u is changing over time. And if you Therefore, plot u and whenever, you know, it doesn't matter how complicated this equation is, what this tells you is that if it's at the minima, it will just get stuck there. If it's a maxima, it will get stuck there, except that the maxima is an unstable and the minima are stable. So, all the minima correspond to stable equilibria. and the maxima will be unstable equilibrium, okay? So I'm denoting maxima by open circles to indicate it's an unstable equilibrium and the minima by a sort of a shaded circle, okay? So this is a very nice intuition, very helpful intuition. And, uh, and uh, so if you think about the way we do linear stability analysis is that we look at an equilibria and we look at the region around it Okay, if you look at the region around the equilibria, the equations always look like this. Okay. And uh, so that's the basic idea of, you know, stability analysis. If this uh, equilibria is stable, then you have a, well, if you have a uh, unstable equilibria, you're actually on, on a mountain. So that's the difference. Yeah. It's the deviation from the equilibrium. Okay. Okay, so that's the potential, so that's great, okay. Um, so the next thing maybe what we should do uh, to help us go forward, we have to go jump a bit now, okay. So let us now, why don't we apply this to a specific model, okay. That might be very helpful, right. You know, why don't we just apply these techniques to a specific model and that way uh, we will get some intuition of how this works. Okay, so the specific model I have in my mind, so how many of you ha had a time to look at Zeeman's model of unstable market behavior? Did any of you have a chance? You don't, it's okay, fine. So I will tell you what his model was without giving an economic interpretation. So my role is to only start with the equation he wrote and then solve that to see what kind of dynamics it actually is going to tell you, okay? So the model he wrote was this. He wrote x dot is equal to um, okay? So I'm not going to justify what are these parameter values, but if you go back to his paper, what you will find is he interprets H as fundamentalists or as the, you know, uh, the, the relative number of chartists. So chartists themselves have two types of traders and uh, one of some of them are, you know, pessimists and other are optimists. So this basically measures the relative numbers of those, okay. So I'm not going into those, so I know you should go back and read the paper. So this is the model he writes for stock market, okay. And x is the stock market index. So let us try to see what kind of a potential does this admit, okay? And what kind of a you know um, uh, uh, dynamical structure that, that that does the system actually admit, okay? Um, let us. So if you, um, so maybe one. I, th I think one simple simple way which provides a lot of intuition. So the equation itself might look a bit complex if you have never seen this before. So, but all of you understand this intuition, right? 
So all of you agree with this intuition, right? So why don't we just construct the potential for this equation, okay? So let's say u of x for Zeeman, okay? Is basically a negative integral of this equation so minus h y minus h plus r y fine so far fine i uh, just using uh, y as some dummy variable so what do we get we have h x minus r over 2 plus So this is the potential for uh, Zeeman's model. So this has a linear term, a quadratic term and a quartic term. Okay. So let us take a simple case when h is actually equal to 0. And let us assume that this r is positive. Um, would you, how many of you would be not comfortable plotting this function? All of you can plot this function. So I'll just very briefly explain how will you plot this. Let's say you have u, to plot x, h equal to 0 meaning there is no linear term. So you have a positive quartic term and a negative quadratic term, okay. Now if x is very, very large, which will dominate? The, quad, the quartic term will dominate, which is a positive term which means things will grow at a rate of x power 4 when x is very, very large and x power 4 is uh, symmetric around x equal to 0. If for both, for both, you know, positive x and negative x, you should see a rapid rise, okay, which is proportional to x power 4, fine. Now, when x is very, very small, which of the two terms will dominate? x is very small, this quadratic term will dominate, right? So closer you are to the quadratic term, which is what? Negative, negative, which means, so at x equal to 0, of course, you have 0, okay? That's easy. For Now, if you increase x a bit, on both sides, there is a decline in the potential values, right? So what do you expect? It does this. Now, we know the behavior for very small values of x, you know the behavior for very large values of x, right? But they are in the opposite direction. The only way to connect them because it's a very nice and smooth function is to, is this way. It didn't connect, but you know, fine. Do you all agree? Oh, because just take a value of 0 0.01, 0 0.1, okay? What is x square? 0 0.01. What is x power 4? One more 0, right? Maybe. Yeah. That's the reason. So, for very small values of x, the smaller powers are important. Okay. So, this now you don't know the actual numbers, but you already know the its equilibrium behavior, right? You know, if you start the stock market somewhere in this region, it will it will reach this equilibria, right? If you start it very, very high, there are things that's pushing it down. Of course, you know, if you read, read the economics behind the equations, you will understand why it's happening, um, okay? And if you are somewhere here, you will reach this equilibria. So what this very simple model admits is that there are multiple stable equilibria for the stock market. And depending on where you started the stock market from, you might end up in one of these two. Do all of you agree with this? Any questions on this so far? Exactly, yeah, potentially exactly same as the, you know, the attract, you know, basin, the entire basin, um, you know, so therefore, for this equilibria, the basin of attraction is, you know, from 
anything that's left of 0 for this equilibria anything to the right of uh, 0 okay so if we start with any value less than 0 it's all going to flow to this if we start with greater than 0 it's all going to flow to this and it's symmetric you know i haven't drawn this perfectly because it's equal to 0 and you have an x square and an x4 term this is a symmetric function okay i have just messed up a bit uh, in writing the in plotting this all fine any questions Yeah. Oh, you have to. Yeah, you can. You know, you have to. You have to take. Uh, okay. So, what is the return rate? For example, if you are in this equilibria, equilibrium, uh, and then you make a perturbation, it comes back to the equilibrium. So, you have to measure. If you want to measure that rate, what do you need to do? You should look at the function at this point and take the second derivative. Right, because the curvature determines how fast you flow down. Okay, but it's the second derivative that will tell you how fast you are going. But if you if you were plotting, you know, Petri yesterday was also plotting these functions, but he was plotting the rate function directly. So you know, don't get confused between the two. The interpretations change. So if you are using the f function, the whenever the f function crosses the x-axis, that's the equilibria. Whereas here, whenever there are minima or maxima, that's the equilibrium. Okay, so so first, you know, make sure your interpretation matches with what you're plotting. Okay, now if you're plotting f as a function of x, the rate will be given by the slope at the equilibria. Whereas here, it's a curvature at the equilibria. Okay. Okay, fantastic. So now let us introduce different values of h and see how things will change. Because that was easy, no? Okay. So case two. So h equal h h positive. I realize that if I speak like this, it doesn't the voice doesn't transmit. <laughs> so let's say you have h positive, and let's say we try to try to plot this now. So how do you think this function will change? So this is a symmetric function now. I'm sorry. I will try to read. Yeah, slightly better. Let's say it's positive. Okay. So how will this function change? Okay. So for positive values of h, what's happening? You're adding stuff, right? For negative values, what's happening? You're actually subtracting. So in this potential, what's happening? On the positive axis, it's going to go up. On the negative axis, it's going to go down. Right. So if h is not very large, but then what's going to happen is that you have a deeper well on the left side and you have a shallower well on the oh sorry, sorry. Actually that's okay, no? Yeah, that's actually okay, sorry, sorry. It's actually okay. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it does know. So again, if you want to understand what happens near zero, um, look at the lowest order term, which is hx, which is hx, which is a simple linear thing. No, so it has to be like this at for very small values. It is positive. It will go. Hmm? So now the um, equilibria are this one: stable equilibria, stable equilibria, and unstable equilibria. So unstable equilibria has moved above zero now. It's not zero anymore. Okay, and if we, if I increase h a little bit more, what's going to happen? This will tilt even more, right? Okay, I'm not going to now plot all the axes. You know, I'm just going to going to be like this. Okay, and if we increase h substantially more, what's going to happen? So if h is really really large, so initially the whole point of this being negative followed by a positive was the x square term was the dominant term, but if the coefficient of which is really really large, in fact that may never be realized. Okay, which means that you may end up getting something like this. Now imagine that 
for some reason this parameter h is slowly changing over time very very slowly changing over time and if you started with this equilibria so stock market is in this equilibria right and it's going to because h has changed it has come to this equilibria now what has changed between this and this the basin of attraction for the you know large values of stock market has reduced now so we had a huge basin of attraction here now what's the basin of attraction now it is relatively much smaller and eventually what's going to happen the basin of attraction will become zero and this would basically flow down to okay um the other equilibria so if you if you were to actually plot the stock market index x as a function of time you will see that it might show a sudden drop although the if you know but on, although the parameter h that might be changing linearly you know this is h so although parameter h might be changing linearly the response variable the stock market could you know suddenly flow down okay you know it might have a non linear response so you know if you actually uh, go back home and uh, if you don't mind solving a cubic equation you can actually calculate the position of this equilibria as a function of h and plot that how many of you think you can do this several of you can do this so okay and even if you don't know how to solve a cubic equation you can always sort of you know surrender yourself to some programs okay huh plot it in r maybe you know r has a function that i helps you find a root i think okay of an equation so use that function and then find the root as a function of h plot that okay so you can always do that if you are not very sure you don't know how to solve the mathematically how many of you use mathematica it will be very easy if you use mathematica how many of you use mathematica only one person uses mathematica okay okay and uh, so i am going to give you one result uh, which is so all of you now know what is a bifurcation diagram in fact we can qualitatively construct a bifurcation diagram from these pictures so what is a bifurcation diagram it is basic it basically tells you how do your equilibria change as a function of parameter values in the in the model so have you did you do the test today in one of you yeah, probably showed right we have we have shown that right maybe i'll just solve one simple case should i solve one simple case to make this clear you know how to how to actually do a okay so you know that simple linear system right that just way too trivial and easy okay there is no bifurcation diagram for that okay because the equilibria is always basically zero so it's kind of pointless so now let us take a slightly more complex equation which is x dot is equal to a minus x square okay so how do you find the equilibria for this to find the equilibria what is your you have to first find the function f of x what is that a minus x square whatever is on the right hand side so that's the first second point i have written there and how do you find the equilibria you set this to zero okay equal to zero implies a minus x square is equal to zero so i'm going to use the x star to denote an equilibrium okay so a minus x square is equal to 0 okay this implies um what is x star x star would be plus or minus square root of a there are two equilibria for this system when a is positive right assuming a is positive if a is negative there are no equilibria right because square root of a doesn't exist in that case so x dot is equal to plus or minus square root of a okay now um bifurcation diagram means only this so if you were f of x had a parameter value such as a how did the equilibria depend on the parameter values in them and in this case it's just remarkably easy you know x star is basically square root of a 
okay so can we plot x star as a function of a what would be that so for negative values of a there is no no equilibria nothing to draw there but for the positive a you have two values plus square root of a and a negative square root of a do you know how does that function look like is it linear it won't be linear it has to be more than that so it will be like something like this okay so basically this is showing you both the equilibria as a function of the parameter value a okay but this does not capture one crucial information what is that it doesn't tell me whether the equilibria is stable or not so now let us try to find out there are two equilibria which of them is stable which of them is unstable okay should we do that so how do we do so if you again look at the point number 2 there you have to look at the derivative at the x star in fact we can just plot this potential also it will be easy no maybe do you prefer the potential approach to find the equilibria so let's find the potential for this what would that be it's a negative of this and then take the integral so it will be x square minus a integral which will be x cube by 3 minus ax fine i'm going to sort of throw off the um let's say a equal to 0 let's make a equal to 0 this will be x cube by 3 uh something like this Ah, uh, the equilibrium is there is really no equilibrium in the stick set. There is an equilibrium here because the potent, you know, the u has this slope zero there. It can just sit there, but it will flow off to negative infinity very quickly. If I increase a, what's going to happen? If we have a positive a, um, initially what will happen? Around zero. This term is dominating, which means for positive values of x, actually the curve will come down. Uh, for negative values of x, what's going to happen? Huh? You go up, is that right? Uh, okay, yeah, that's right, yeah. So this will be the behavior for small values of x. For large values of x, the behavior will be still the same, right? Because this term dominates and this term dominates. So now just connect these pieces. Do you all agree with this? Huh? So you have a positive root and a negative root. Which of them is stable? The positive root is stable. This is stable. This will be unstable. Okay. That means which of the two is positive here? This is the positive root. This is the negative root. So this is stable, this is unstable. Usually what we do is that we write the unstable branch with a dotted line okay so this picture is true for all values of a the only thing that will change is the position of this minima and maxima they will just move away as you increase a so this is the bifurcation diagram and in fact this bifurcation is also called the saddle node saddle node bifurcation Great. And um, now if I have, if I repeat, now the thing is, you know, this is this procedure that I used for one, this simple equation. I could replace it by the complex equation. I can find the, all the roots. I can find the equilibria again. And if I do, if I do this, this is what we get for the Zeeman's model as a function of h. This is the Zeeman's model as a function of h. 
there will be a large value of stock market okay that decreases like this and there is a point okay so this, this is a dotted line so what's very interesting about the Siemens model is that you look at this picture here okay this picture where there is a stable equilibria and an unstable equilibria this picture is locally true exactly the same thing is happening in this region and in this region but for the shape you know it's a bit you know upside down and all that's more of a you know just a detail so what you have is basically in a uh, in Siemens model you have saddle node bifurcation in this direction another bifurcation in this direction and what's very interesting is that if you now change H right if you are in this branch if you change H you are moving slowly on this right but there is a value of H if you increase beyond that the system will basically collapse to this value okay If you change it slowly, it will follow this branch and it suddenly falls off. Now, on the other hand, if you do the reverse, now having collapsed here, if you now reverse the values of H, will it change here? It won't. It, it actually is stuck in that minima. So, it won't change there until you reach another threshold point and then you have another abrupt change to the previous branch. Okay. And this is called the cusp catastrophe. Any questions on this? Okay. So, what, what we have done so far is that we have used Siemens model to show that for small changes in parameter values, you can have large responses in the state of the system. Okay. So, this basically sort of provides a possible explanation for uh, something like an abrupt change that might happen in a stock market, right? But it does. What is that? Uh, the small. This, if R is negative, you do not have this bifurcation diagram, you will have something like that. Yeah, because if R is not negative, it, it this doesn't go down, right? You don't have multiple stable equilibria at all. It just will be like this all the time. I mean, only the I mean, in terms of economics, so if the speculators above a threshold value, then only you have this by stable dynamic. Otherwise, you don't have a by stable dynamic. The economics interpretation is that R is a measure of proportion of speculators and if, uh, if it is above a threshold value then only you can actually have this multiple stable equilibrium. Everybody is a fundamentalist basically if they are dominating then they will reach the fundamental values very clear very fast and there is no scope for bistability. Yeah. Yes, that will that I will come to that next yes, yeah, yeah I will come to that next now yes. Any questions on this? So now we have a very simple model that shows abrupt transition. The next step we want to do is that you know, is there something about being close to this threshold point, okay, or close far away from this? Is there something that's different about the system if I am here or if I am here? That's what I am going to try to do next. Is the is the motivation clear? Okay. So if you really want to be able to predict something. You must know whether I'm, you know, you are somewhere close to a, you know, this kind of a threshold point, or if you are really far away from that. And there's something that can capture that is what I am going to do next. Okay. Um, to do that, let's try to let's try to look at one very simple quantity that. Uh, Raghav talked about, it is called the return rate. So, return rate is you know how fast you come back to the equilibrium once you make a perturbation. How do you find the return rate? To find the return rate you know just look at the 
first point there you if x is the perturbation from the equilibrium i have to measure that coefficient r if i can measure the coefficient r we know the return rate of the equilibrium right okay so to measure the return rate i need to know the coefficient r now since this model locally looks like exactly this model if i analyze this model is it good enough for us okay yeah r will be positive right you don't return to yeah, yeah so basically yeah it doesn't make sense to even call something called a return rate for an unstable equilibrium because it never returns there that's why i call it a growth rate usually so her question was what if what is the return rate if you have an unstable equilibrium i said that you know the concept of return rate makes only sense for a stable equilibrium because you come back to it okay you return back to the equilibrium so the return rate how do we calculate return rate so we just need to know the coefficient r and i also i did not prove this really but i also told you that the return rate r is basically nothing but the derivative of f at the equilibrium i know <laughs> which other r do you have oh there is this uh, zeeman's r <laughs> let's make that z huh sorry i'm going to change this is easy for me to change not for you since this is zeeman's so i'll make him z okay that's it okay very easy for me but not so easy for you <laughs> so only in the zeeman's mod i changed r, that r to z okay you don't have to pay attention to this if you don't want okay so for those who were super attentive yesterday you may have heard of normal form right so i was using a normal form for the saturnor bifurcation yeah okay so is the notation clear um no issues about the notations right now so so now basic idea now is i want to look at the return rate of the system uh and i want to calculate the return rate for this simple model because this simple model captures what's happening locally at this bifurcation point at this threshold point uh so that's the idea so because that model is not somewhat more complicated right it has cubic and other terms so but it's a simpler model and this still captures the local dynamics that's the basic idea okay so now let us look at return rate for this model which requires us to calculate f prime at the equilibrium and in fact i should do this only for a stable equilibrium because unstable equilibrium return rate is really it is really no return rate okay it's zero actually because it never comes back technically uh, but it has a growth rate away from it okay uh, okay so let's do that so what is the x star of interest That is square root of a, huh? And what is f prime of x? That is d by dx of a minus x square, which would be minus two x. And therefore, the return rate is equal to, which is f of x star f prime x star. Minus two square root of um, a. Okay, I made a small mistake. Return rate is actually magnitude of this. Okay, so I'm going to ignore the sign. Because when I was defining return rate, I had already taken the sign out. Okay, it was minus r x. Okay. So return rate for the this saddle node bifurcation event is given by 
is proportional to square root of it. Okay. Now, what does that tell us? Is it any useful at all? Does that tell us anything that we want? So, what is our aim? We would like to look at what is it that's different from far away from the bifurcation and close to the bifurcation, right? So, when you are close to bifurcation, what happens to values of value of a? What is the value of a when you are close to bifurcation? a goes to 0 near the bifurcation, right? As the system approaches bifurcation, a goes to 0. Is that right? Which basically means the return rate which is equal to square root of a, okay, also approaches 0. In fact, you can say stronger than this, you can say the return rate approaches to 0 as a square root of a, okay, but this is a more qualitative information, but it is still correct, okay. So, basic idea is this is sort of, you know, is this. As we are approaching the bifurcation, the return rate is increasing. As a consequence, um, oh sorry, as you approach the bifurcation, the, this main parameter is reducing going to 0. As a consequence, the return rate is also going to 0. Conversely, if I have a real data and if you find the return rate is going to 0, maybe we can argue that I am approaching a bifurcation. Is that, is that argument clear? Very, just the inverse of this, okay. So, conversely, if we measure return rate of a dynamical system, here the dynamical system could be Dow Jones index. So, you take the Dow Jones index data and you somehow magically extract the return rate from it and all that we will come to. How do we do? I am going to explain that later. If I can calculate this, right, and if that is approaching zero, that means that system is headed for a So, this is the main argument of devising an early warning signal, which means a measurement of return rate can potentially provide you an early warning signal of an imminent collapse, okay. Of course, you know statistically how do you measure return rate is a next question, we will come to that very shortly. Is, is everyone in agreement with this? How much time do you have? Okay. So, we will do a little bit more of, you know, uh, just one more calculation, um, which actually, now, now the thing is, you can ask a question, many of these parameter values are stochastic, right? And, you know, would this result be true even when you have stochasticity in the model? Okay. So, so the next step I am going to do this, do is basically, um, you know, uh, see if you have stochasticity, what is the consequence of return rate going to 0? That is the next step I will do, but before I go, I will just want to make sure you know you have no other questions. So, I think we will be able to finish this you know mathematics part in this lecture and when we come back, uh, we will maybe for half an hour or so, we will try to see if you can actually analyze that yourself um, in R and then I do not think you will be able to complete it, but we will just do some of it and then I will show you the results from our you know, paper uh, with uh, in Rockwell and different students. That's the plan. So, but let me know if you have any questions here. Now, I will give you one. Maybe all this looks very, very complex, right? So, let's for a time being forget everything beyond this. Okay. So, if you have been sleeping until now, just get get back to this. So, all of you, I hope, were with me up to this point where I said that uh, this 
you know, dramatic change can be thought of as this simple diagram, right? So as we are approaching this bifurcation point, this potential is becoming more asymmetric, right? It also is be the the basin of attraction is reducing, and you know, and and uh, and therefore there is a this kind of a collapse. Okay. Now let's focus at this equilibrium point and the basin of attraction. So as you go from here to here, what do you see? There is a change in the some features of this potential. What has changed? Just look at the dynamic, you know, just the, what has happened? It has become, it has flattened, right? Okay, now forget all the mathematics. If you, if you don't know any mathematics, you know that if we have a flat bowl versus a very deep bowl, and if you throw a marble in this, which system will return faster? The one with a steep bowl, the, the, the marble will come back to the minima very fast compared to the one with the flat ball, right? Okay, so which means the return rate is large for a steep ball compared to a shallow ball. Okay, that alone is sufficient to sort of understand all the complicated mathematics I did there. Um, you know, basically as you go towards the bifurcation point, this potential landscape becomes flattened, more and more flattened, because of which system takes now longer to come back to the equilibrium once you make a perturbation. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, so just a simple, very simple intuitive argument doesn't require any, any sort of mathematics to sort of worry about. Okay. Uh, because basically the second derivative of this potential at the equilibrium also is same as the, uh, you know, the return rate. Okay. Because the first derivative will be a f of x, second derivative will be f prime of x, which is what which was what I was really calculating. So it's just you know all our all we need is our intuition um, to sort of make sense of this. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm wondering what to do next. Should we do the um, would you be interested in knowing you know, how would you do a simple stochastic calculation for this stochastic variable calculation? Okay, so I'm going to erase this part. Okay, I'm going to erase all of this. Okay, so how do we do a stochastic counterpart and measure some properties in that? Okay, so what we basic the basic idea remains same. So it doesn't matter how complex your equation is near the equilibrium. All that matters is what's happening, you know, close to the equilibrium. All that matters is you know a very small portion, and because of that, you can always make a linear approximation. Okay. So the basic idea is that around an equilibrium, in fact, a stable equilibrium, so we can always write down um, if x is equal to, you know, x minus x star. So x star is the real equilibrium value. I am focusing on the deviation from the equilibrium. And this value, this basically will behave like this, right? Will be in the return, you know, it, it basically will behave like this. It actually will exponentially decay towards the equilibrium value. But I am going to assume that it is constantly being perturbed by some kind of a stochastic term. So there is no determinist, there is no deterministic um, um, equation, but there is some stochastic element here. Okay, and um, so when we have stochastic term, uh, I think Srikanth very nicely explained that you know you will not be able to write down a 
equation like this, we have to change our calculus a bit. So instead what you do is basically you write like this. And one of the easiest way to incorporate stochasticity is through you know Wiener process. Right? So what I am adding here is an increment of a Wiener process. Is that right? Okay. Now do all of you, some of you at least remember Ito equation? <laughs> Ito, Ito integral? <laughs> okay, you don't have to remember. Uh, you should try maybe revisit Srikanth lectures and try to see how to write down, <laughs> you know, Ito integral. But I'll just write it for you, huh? You're making a ghost. <laughs> okay, I'll actually, it actually is much easier than you think it is. Okay, it actually is just doing a integration. You know, multiply by an integral factor and then take integration. Okay. So, this part is easy, right? If you did not have the stochastic term, this would be true. System will decay exponentially. That part is easy, right? Okay. Now, the second part is the Ito's part. Just let me know if I get the sign wrong, okay? Is that right? Shikant. Yes. <laughs> yeah, also sometimes I'm very nervous when I'm writing this. <laughs> so you have a deterministic part which makes perfect sense. You have a stochastic part. Um, oh, is there no is there not an x x t here? No. No. It's independent. No, actually there is separate out for the OU process, right? That's a okay. Um, what do we do with this? Uh, okay, so now what do we do? Uh, we have a actually an exact integral uh, that can do a lot of things. So whenever you have a stochastic process, what quantities do you measure? Mean, variance, and correlations. Three things are very very fundamental, right? Mean you, any given random numbers. It is irrelevant how complicated the equation is. Three things you would ideally like to measure it as a starting point. You would also like to know the distribution entirely, but sometimes it's a lot more harder. In this case, you do know. In fact, I think Shrikant derived what the distribution is and I, I, when t goes to the infinity, right? Yeah, in the stationary sense. And then also, but you know, we won't go to the distribution part. Let us just focus on mean and variance and correlations, okay? So what is the mean of xt? This angular brackets indicate mean, if you did not know. So we have a deterministic part that doesn't change much. Yeah, you have a question? Yes, sir, sir uh, so whatever framework you discussed here, mm -hmm. x was not a random variable. Yes, until now it wasn't. Now it is. So now you changed to random. So now I'm basically telling that once system is, let us say, around the equilibrium of this framework, and I basically am adding a stochastic term, which is given by an increment of Wiener process. Okay. Exactly. It's an assumption. You can question the assumption saying, you know, this is a wrong, you know, it's a lot more complicated, but yes, it's just, yeah. The test is the distance. Yes, it's time. It's a, yeah, it's an integrable time, time variable, no, actually. It's time. Is there something wrong here? XT, it must be an XT here, no? Excess, no. We will do, we can do one thing if you are not very sure, why don't we take a, you know, we can take a derivative and then we will know the, if it's correct or wrong. Should we? Uh -huh. Correct, no? I think it's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's okay. You can actually, actually it, it must be in your, I can actually make sure it's correct. Okay. Well, I think it's correct. I mean, I so in, in Shrikant's notes, you should see an m, that's a mean value, and have just said m is equal to 0, that's all. Um, no, no, this is a time integral, it's a dummy variable. Yeah. T is the current time, 0 is the starting time. Time 0, you are 0 away from the equilibrium. Like T minus 
at, at time x, that was dws, right? The yeah. impact of that is exponentially different. Yeah. That is a to the minus r t minus. So you are yeah. multiplying dws. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great way of. At time x, mm -hmm. The shock at time x, the effect of that shock increased exponentially. Yeah, and then you are in, and you are then adding all of them. Yes, that's a, that's a very nice interpretation, yes. So let's find the mean of this. So the first term is a deterministic term, so it's a happy term. Nothing you have to do nothing about this. The second term, what is the val mean of the second term? This is again a deterministic part. No, I can take the well, you know, if you're not a mathematician, <laughs> I can take the mean inside. What is the mean of increment? Mean of a stochastic integral. At least this integral. <laughs> well, sorry. No. <laughs> so maybe, hopefully, going slow will help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, at least for this, you know, without going in even to martingales, this is a constant, you know, non-deterministic part multiplied with a stochastic part. So, the mean of this will be mean of this, right? You know, this integral times the mean of this. What is the mean of increment of Wiener process? What is the fundamental property of Wiener process and the increments? The increments are? Uh, oh, yeah, and one more thing. Increments are have are normally, it has a mean 0, no? Okay. So, this term will be 0. Okay. So the mean is basically. Uh, mean value of x t is basically x zero e power minus r t. Okay. Now let's do the next step, which is um, let's do correlation. All of you know what is correlation, right? Correlation. Let's say you want to correlate the value of x at time t to value of x at some t prime. So you want to know how these perturbations that are happening are correlated, which are time t and t at t prime. That's what I'm going to do now. Shikant is smiling, I don't know why. <laughs> so all of you know the how to the definition of correlations, right? So it's the mean value of x e minus mu, let's say this is mu times x yeah 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 covariance and correlations. See for a process which has mean uh, you know, which is around zero, I usually don't calculate. You know, yeah, it's called co covariance if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think statistician, I think physicists, physicists call this correlation. So, yeah, yeah. So, correlation is always You divide by variance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Physicists don't distinguish the two, so it's okay. Co sorry, sorry, correlation, covariance. Yeah, the name is irrelevant actually. So can we do this? So what is x t minus mu? Mu is this. Okay, x t minus mu will be this term, and x t prime minus mu will be zero to t prime of this term, and then I multiply them, and then I take the average. So all of you are in agreement with me? It's basically this zero to t e power minus r e minus s d w s 0 to t prime e power minus r t minus s d w s prime okay this is um so s and okay okay so let me explain to be sure the first term which is here is basically this. So integral from 0 to t and dws. S is the integration dummy variable. Okay. The second term starts here to here. I have used s prime to avoid repetition. You have a question? You have a taking the mic. No, you don't have a question. Fine. So now how do we do this? This is slightly more complicated. 
okay because of which i won't do this entirely so basically what you need to know to actually it actually is not very difficult by the way you just need to know what is the covariance of dws and dws prime did you do that trikant in your is dt no yeah. exactly oh, great right. somebody remembers this fantastic <laughs> shrikant <Yes>. can <laughs> no but the s and s prime though it's not dws dws so therefore you have a delta delta dirac delta i mean yeah. thing is i know shrikant will not allow me to use dirac delta functions that will make my life very easy <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly yeah 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 so so yeah, the intuition so what's really happening if you don't understand this is this is the following intuition so both the integrals start from 0 to t right 0 right one goes to t other goes to t prime let's say this is 0 this is the time axis and this is 0 this is s this is s prime right so oh that's the full integration yes but i'm only looking at this now increments okay so one of the in the first integral i have dws in the second integral we have dws prime okay oh yeah, yeah right 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 oh yeah that's right sorry sorry so it's the increment around here around here and unless s is actually equal to s prime these two increments will be independent and that will also force me eventually to make t is equal to t prime and this double integral actually becomes a single integral if you do all those a little bit of algebra carefully and yeah exactly exactly yeah covariance okay i'm just going to write the final answer here just to make the you know keep everyone's life easy to be roughly on these lines, okay. Covariance. Let me let me make sure if it's correct, okay. I may I may get this wrong. Okay, this is R, not really. Yeah, I had taken sigma equal to one, is it? Is it no sigma? Right, right, right. Okay, fine. Let me see if this is correct, huh? Mm. 1 minus this is correct when t equal to 0 you have maximum covariance no yeah yeah okay that's a good point so this must be any other so you know the form of the equation i just want to make sure we can construct it correctly so if t is equal to t prime what do we get we have what zero no actually i think it is just this it should it should have a t minus t prime all that matters is how far tie t and t prime are not really absolute values right yeah no 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 no, no it, it will just depend on this The variance doesn't become equal to the stationary variance of the Okay, okay, okay. Okay, that's a good point. I think I think that's a great point. I think what you also have is a term which looks like this. Um yeah, that's a good point. So I think this equation is an approximation when t and t prime both go to infinity. Or the t plus t prime goes to infinity. Do you have the expression, the exact expression? Uh, t equal to 0 then you have e power 0 that I, t equal to 0 uh, you know part is going okay um, so i so shrikant is right there is actually additional term which looks like e power minus r t plus t prime okay and that e power minus r t plus t prime when t and t prime are both very large goes to 0 so i have ignored that term here yeah no no i mean I have, 
No, I yeah. didn't. Yeah, there is an additional term here, you know, which is which looks something like this. So there is an additional term like this. Okay, so so I am ignoring that under the assumption that I am sufficiently far away from, um, you know, initial perturbation events. Therefore, both T and T prime are really really large, and therefore this is okay. Okay, which means we are in steady state basically. You know, all these calculations are in steady state. Okay, but this form I am pretty sure is correct. Because when t is equal to t prime, so this there will be no correlations, and you only have one over r term. Okay. Okay. So basically, the reason why we calculate something like covariance is something we know how to calculate to in a covariance when you have a you know stochastic time t series, right? We can use statistical methods, and then what this basically makes a prediction is the following: because r goes to zero. When you approach the bifurcation point, this covariance, therefore, will what will happen to this? You have a one over r term. So covariance actually diverges as you approach bifurcation. I mean, here's the key idea, you know, forgetting all the mathematics behind how we got the equation. This r goes to zero as we approach bifurcation point. Therefore, covariance um, technically diverges. Of course, we will never really have divergence in real, real data. It actually should increase somewhat dramatically at, a, at at least the rate one over r or so. To you know, and if you observe such a increase in covariance, you can infer that you might be approaching a bifurcation. So last part is the last argument that I made in the last ones. One minute is the most important one for early warning signals. So if you have any questions, you should ask me. Yeah. Sir, uh, Suran, this uh, sigma sigma you replaced with one should be t. Ah, yeah, yeah. They, no, no, no. So, no t. Sir. So basically, I should have started this way. Okay. Then I would have had some sigma here, and I would have had a sigma square here. Okay. That makes. But you know, but there is no t term there for sure. Yeah, because of this independence. The expectation of DW as DWS is DL. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's that's a T plus T prime that I forgot when I was writing this. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions? The basic idea is that if you if you now take the Dow Jones data, right, uh, that was there, and if you calculate the covariance over time, you know, how it is how is the covariance changing over time? It should basically increase at uh, the very minimum. Um, if it is true that the financial market crash is same as a bifurcation point, okay. So we can separate this out a bit more to make the calculations of time series tractable. So covariance, if I set t is equal to t prime, what do we get in a covariance? I, I somehow remember getting a 2. It's OK. It's any approximation, so it's OK. <laughs> It has to be. There's no way it can't be anything, anything else. There are two terms. Only one has to be this term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, these two will give you t plus t. Plus t prime minus two s. Huh. So basically, when t becomes t prime, then you have one over two. Yeah. The two comes from that. You know, e power minus two t, two t r, yeah. integral of that. And uh, okay. Um, yeah, I will write this up and put it on you know on the website. You want to go through the exact calculations, okay? So covariance, when you have t is equal to t prime, will be basically same as variance, right? Okay. So therefore, variance 
should increase you know as you know as stock market you know approaches a bifurcation point right okay and likewise now this covariance depends on t minus t prime how far the two data points in your time series that you take now clearly if you take very far away points they will be uncorrelated right their correlation is decaying exponentially right so when you are actually doing a real calculation uh, what we usually do is we don't take huge lags we take lags which are very nearby so the nearest lag one can think of is you know in whatever time scale you are measuring you can take the lag one okay so so what you can measure is the covariance or correlation at lag one okay because higher lags you know sort of you know decays rapidly uh, okay but you know the smallest lag that you can potentially measure or the thing has dynamical effects that should increase you know as the stock market mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah yeah absolutely true yeah 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 but i always mean this though i mean i don't usually divide <laughs> because it can also have an opposite effect if the variance is reducing then you make it a spurious effect of uh, correlation increasing also right you can go both ways uh, but the mathematical theory predicts only about the as you call covariance okay i think physicists don't use good terminology they just keep flipping between the two so they in fact by correlation they mean three things one of it is this one of it is with divide and divide by sigma square the third one is just xt times xt prime depending on the convenience so uh, depending on the problem at hand so but we will use the standard terminology of covariance okay so covariance at lag 1 increases you know as the stock market approaches lag okay so do you think these two predictions will be correct I don't know. <laughs> so, in some sense, you know what we have done is that we have taken we have taken a standard, you know, cusp catastrophe model, and we can actually now make predictions about standard some very simple properties of time series that you know um, people always measure. The quantities themselves are really simple. And the theory predicts that these two quantities, you know, should increase in this following way. Okay, so um, I think I will stop at this. When we come back, we will, uh, you know, use your packages and try to do an analysis of this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, example you showed here. Uh -huh. So you have a flat bowl and you have a very steep bowl. Where is it? Sorry. Here, this figure, this diagram. So if in a steep bowl, uh, here, here, release a ball, uh -huh. it will go, grow, uh, it will go faster to the, to the equilibrium point. Exactly. Why it takes longer? Yeah, it will take a long time yes, in a yes. flat bowl. Now here, one inherent factor that we are assuming is there is a presence of gravity. Presence of gravity. Gravity. I'm not assuming that. No, no. In a ball, a ball, how will it go? If in a real ball. No, no. What I have shown you when I when I did this calculation uh. is that a dynamical system following this equation okay. is same as a ball rolling in a landscape. So I have mathematically proven this. I'm not assuming this. So there is a potential you have is out there, right? Which yeah, yeah, yeah. Is going. I have. I have. This is a proof. It's, I'm not assuming this. No. Okay. So an assumption. So how do you, uh, in a real stock data we have, when you uh -huh. are trying to locate a, uh, a crisis or mm -hmm. catastrophe, then what, uh, how do you look at this, how do you see this potential? But there is no meaning to the potential. Okay. It's just a mathematical construct. That's why I didn't call it a gravity, no? Okay. It's an analogy that seems to work really well.
except that you know you, you know you, you have to be a bit careful you are interpreting ball rolling in the landscape as a system of you know with a very high damped uh, you know i mean a high high friction uh, so yeah the analogy works very well or in other words you can say there is no inertia okay so sir another thing uh, in our, in finance literature uh, there is a notion of financial bubble mm -hmm. so and people have been trying to yeah. model that so yeah, yeah, yeah. is it same as uh, what we are trying to do no the bubble part this doesn't capture it only catch it only captures the crash part okay so bubble bursting part it captures but how does the bu bubble itself grow this doesn't capture okay yeah but the other models that do So okay, I think we can start, right? Okay. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, um, use a few more slides. So the question we were interested was, um, if we had um, these data prior to a crash, would we have anticipated? Okay. So we took this simple bifurcation modeling approach, and we argued that there are true predictions we can make um, because of the fact that as you approach um uh, a bifurcation point the return rate reduces because of that the variance um, of the system should increase as you approach a crash and uh, correlation at lag one i have chosen this specifically because it's relatively easy to measure compared to larger lags okay i mean um, to relatively easy to obtain a statistical significance for uh, covariance at lag one compared to uh, something else okay that's the main idea. So now I'm going to um, just briefly recap how we did this. We used this simple model of verification, right? Um, and then, um, so this actually leads to this kind of a bifurcation diagram. And uh, so how did we obtain this? We obtained the equilibrium of the equation above. Or now I have a new variable u. Okay, you have to <laughs> get used to it. So find the u star by solving the right-hand side equation. Find the stability, and you get this very nice um, catastrophe bifurcation. And um, this point, where the state of the system dramatically changes, that's called a bifurcation point in a very generic sense. Uh, some people also refer to it as critical point, and that terminology comes more from physics literature, because these kind of points are also used to um, understand how matter changes from one phase to another phase, such as you know, solid becoming liquid, liquid becoming gas, or a magnet becoming non-magnet. So changes in phases of matter. Uh, to understand that equation, you'd be really surprised. Um, Landau, a physics, a physics Nobel laureate, actually wrote the exact same potential that we use today. Okay, and his argument was that the system reaches this minima of this potential, and uh, you know, and uh, and that's how we can understand phases of matter. Okay. And uh, these transitions are sometimes are called catastrophic transitions, critical transitions more recently, okay? Uh, and, uh, and there are also another class of transitions which I did not really mention much, and they're called stochastic transitions. And those happen not at the point of bifurcation, but they happen, they can happen much farther away from a, uh, you know, this bifurcation point. Now, how can that happen? when you have large amount of stochasticity in a system, right? So because when you have a large amount of stochasticity, um, you know, a perturbation, you know, if you think of these landscapes again, a large perturbation can push you off the, you know, nearby, you know, hill, and therefore you are going to fall onto the other valley, right? So if you are, although you are away from the tipping point or bifurcation point, if you can cross this because of stochasticity, even then you can have a abrupt change, okay? There are two types of transitions, broadly speaking, and uh, these are called stochastic transitions. Okay, so now, okay, now 
to really, you know, I showed you a very heuristic of how to obtain potentials. For those who are mathematically inclined, there are actually a lot more rigorous ways um, to do the same thing uh, using an approach called Fokker Planck equation. I won't really go into that, and in fact, you can write down Fokker Planck equations for more complex equations, you know, more complex systems where the stochasticity is also state dependent. Okay. For example, uh, in the equation I wrote, you know, this dx is equal to minus alpha x plus dw, right? So in this equation, the sigma, the strength of the stochasticity was a constant, right? But you could imagine that this sigma itself is a function of x, okay? In those cases, the, the potential description I used is actually inaccurate. Sometimes it's outrightly incorrect. But there are ways to construct potentials for those as well. But I won't go to those, okay? Um, so, and, uh, and I also explained to you why do we use this effective potential? It's because it's very nice in the sense that the minima correspond to stable equilibrium of dynamical systems and the maxima correspond to unstable equilibrium. It works really brilliantly, at least for simple enough systems. The potential itself may have no uh, meaning in a real system, okay? Uh, it's true only for physics that, you know, the potential actually corresponds to potential energy, okay? But not for biological, financial, or other kinds of complex systems. This may have no meaning, uh, but it, it's extremely useful as a ma mathematical construct, okay? Uh, so, and we can then think of the state of the system as ball rolling in this landscape, okay? So now, the early warning signal, so I have also explained this, um, you know, both heuristically and mathematically. So what really is happening is that this uh, potential changes as you're approaching uh, approaching uh, bifurcation point. The potential was steep and symmetric, okay? And then as you're approaching the bifurcation point, this potential is becoming more flattened because of which, you know, um, you know, system takes longer to come back to equilibrium. It has a very fancy name called critical slowing down, meaning as the system is approaching critical point, system is slow to come back to equilibrium, okay? So it's a term that's uh, predominantly used in physics systems. And in fact, this is actually, this also, it's, I mean, you know, you will be surprised to know that this idea actually got a Nobel Prize in physics in 1971. You know, how do we actually work around um, the this issue of critical slowing down and a person named Ken Winson, he, did, he provided the mathematical formalism to solve this, you know, solve the problem of phase transitions, he actually won a Nobel Prize. and uh, uh, and uh, what we also showed was that in this simple derivation, because of this uh, increased variability, system shows large variance. It also shows, um, you know, correlations or covariance between in the time series, okay? Uh, you know, one thing I do want to emphasize a bit here is that as you are approaching, so two things are happening, right? All of you agree that there is an increased variance as we proved here, right? There is an increased variance in the system. Because the return rate is now longer, the system is also highly, you know, also has larger correlations across time. Do you agree that, right? That's what this, this equation shows, right? Even for, you know, for time t and t prime, which are far away, uh, the system uh, will actually uh, show larger and larger uh, relationship between two, uh, you know, system variables as you approach the critical point, right? So, in some sense, it's very counterintuitive because as you're approaching the bifurcation point, the system is becoming more variable, more erratic. At the same time, it is also becoming more correlated, okay? If you just think of as a, any set of random numbers, high variability always, typic, always means less correlations. Do you agree with this, right? But when you approach a bifurcation point, both of them happen simultaneously. Okay, uh, that's in some sense very interesting and very sort of counterintuitive, um, and uh, uh, that in some sense therefore also provides a good evidence that something like this, if you measure both of them at the same time, most likely it's because of this bifurcation event. Okay. Now one more thing um, that happens in this potential as you are approaching this bifurcation point, if you observe the potential has become more and more asymmetric, because of which system is more likely to wander off in this direction as compared to this direction, right? Is that right? Now, if you have a system variable that is wandering more off in one direction than the other, what happens to its, its realization? If you plot the histogram, how will it look like? 
it will be more skewed in one direction than the other direction, right? So in one of the papers in my PhD thesis, I proposed that if you now measure skewness of the time series, and if that is increasing, that could be also used as an early warning signal of this bifurcation event. Okay, so this is independent of these two because of the potential, uh, the way the potential landscape is changing in its features. Okay, so these are the broad ideas. There is a very nice review article that you can read um, in Nature, 2009. Okay, so um, I, to, I I explained to you how you get all these results. Okay, so now the, I have a new symbol alpha instead of R. Okay, the correlation uh, uh, for events separated by time tau in steady state is roughly this, whereas the variance behaves like this. Okay, and these are actually textbook calculations in any simple stochastic process. If you take Gardiner, uh, which is a very standard book that all the physicists use, these equations are there for 40 years. Okay, but the main intuition in the more recent work is that this alpha goes to zero as you approach the critical point or the bifurcation point. Therefore, these quantities measured in a quasi steady state sense or they will actually increase okay and um, so this is an example from a simulation of an ecological model so you can see that you know so for, for example if you take this model okay this you know equation or where is that equation okay this equation sorry this equation if you simulate uh, x as a function of time if you add some stochasticity to this and if you slowly change it you will actually get a time series like this okay uh, and uh, therefore, you can ask if there is a time series which is fluctuating. If I measure the properties of this, this time series, such as variance and correlations, do we get the expected properties? This is the result. So you now the thing is, you know, when you are doing statistics, now the statistics sort of begins to play a role because there are a lot of stochastic events. So this is the actual time series before the event. Okay. Um, so what we have done here is there is a collapse here. If there was a true early warning signal, what should happen? Before you, by the time you reach this, you should see signals. Is that right? So you can see that we have taken this time series here, and then the red line basically is a detrending line. So do all of you know what is the detrending of a time series? Is have any of you done any time series calculations, time series analysis? Some of we have not done. If you have not done, don't worry too much. It's a statistical detail. So what we do is we do a detrending of this time series because the mean is changing over time. You don't want that to influence your results. Okay, so the mean is changing over time. Look at the residuals of the time series. Now, can you see these residuals and see some features in them? What is happening as you are getting close to the? So the residuals have a larger and larger variance, right? And uh, so what this does is, it, you know, in this plot we calculate autocorrelation at lag one uh, over time. You know, as you can see, it's increasing. It's Okay, so this is, um, so I don't want to go into too many details here because that itself becomes a, to understand how we do all these calculations and mapping the value of R to the autocorrelation at lag 1 itself will take, you know, a 10, 5 minute of algebra, not very difficult. Um, uh, but you know, but the main point is that when this, when this lag 1 reaches a value of 1, that is same as this value of R going to 0. Okay, so as you can see, this value is indeed going towards 1 as you approach you know this uh, point of transition okay and then this is the variance instead of standard deviation okay and this is the skewness you know uh, skewness uh, actually has a reverse direction compared to you know uh, variance therefore it actually is reducing and there are statistical methods to calculate whether this trend in the increase or decrease is it actually significant or not so i don't i won't again go into those details okay so this sort of shows that at least in simulations if you take a model like this and if you simulate a catastrophic event you can actually measure all these indicators. Okay, that's what this shows. Okay, and uh, so now, now, so this was all. By the way, this was all the work that was that we were doing in ecology, and uh, uh, you know, so in fact, uh, several experimentalists got really interested in these ideas because in ecology also these catastrophic events are of great importance, and they did some experiments. I'll show you what they did. Okay, so when I first did this paper, when I first did the work. I did not know what exactly is Daphnia, okay. So I never really truly believed that any of this theory can be applicable to real data, okay. So uh, I don't think my advisor himself believed either. So, but this Daphnia or this small organism that swim in lakes, and the nice thing about small organisms is that you can construct a population in a beaker instead of a, you know, elephant corridor, okay. If you want to measure elephant populations, you need a huge space and it's difficult to measure as well. 
Whereas if you take Daphnia, you can have a good population in a small beaker of this size. So what these people, um, you know, John Drake and Griffin did was, they did experiments where they would grow these Daphnia cultures at different levels of food input. Okay. And then what they found was that that system actually showed this kind of a bifurcation diagram. And then what they basically did was, this over period of time, they basically reduced the food input to these Daphnia. So what will happen to poor animals if they are fed little, little every day? Their populations will reduce, right? And eventually they went extinct. So these populations actually went extinct. And, and as it was going towards extinction, they measured these early warning signals. Okay. So in fact, because they were doing experiments, they could even estimate when exactly the tipping point or this bifurcation event actually occurred because they had other set of experiments to sort of calibrate that. And these are the results, you know, uh, the actual extinction event occurs around the day 400. Okay. And this is basically a coefficient of variation and this is the skewness. And what they find is that as you are almost around 100 days before the actual extinction event, which is around 400 day, these, these quantities actually begin to increase as you expected from the theory. And, uh, and uh, among the four indicators that they measured, they found that the variance and skewness showed the most uh, you know, prominent effects. The, the results in the autocorrelation at lag 1 was not very strong. Okay? That was one uh, very little life experiments. And this was followed up by an experiment from a um, physics group in MIT. What they did was they did I think I think much better experiments really. What they now studied was yeast. Yeast are even smaller organisms compared to you know Daphnia. And uh, in fact, they first constructed a you know this bifurcation diagram that remarkably looks like what we have somewhere in the you know behind that you know projection, right? Um, I'm sure you can compare them. In fact, this looks like exactly the cusp catastro you know the Saturn node bifurcation. Okay. Uh, what they have done here is for a different Again, dilution factor basically means the amount of food you are giving. The more dilution factor means less food. Okay, and for different levels of these dilutions, they get a stable population. But there is a point here when the population just cannot sustain themselves. They just undergo a massive shift. Okay, um, this is a, obviously a remarkable system to test early warning signals. So what they then do is they temporarily vary the dilution factors, and they find that you know coefficient of variation, variance autocorrelation, they all three of them actually work very beautifully as early warning signals. However, in their, in this specific system, they did not find the skewness was a statistically significant indicator. Okay. So, you know, in the earlier study, they found that the autocorrelation was not a very good you know, indicator. In this one, they found the skewness was not really great. Um, okay. And they provide some possible reasons why that might be the case. Okay. And there were a few other works. One, one group took this step a little too seriously. They actually uh, went to a lake and they made, uh, you know, the lake collapse to a different state. There was a state of lake with different levels of predators and prey. And I don't know if you have heard of something called a trophic cascade. If you remove predators from, you know, from a lake of a mini system, now predators are gone. The, 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 the next level where the prey, how, on whom these guys were preying on, are happy, they have not, nobody to eat them, right? So they just now grow in abundance, okay? The entire ecosystem shifts to entire new state now. And what they found was in that, in that time series data, they were actually able to uh, anticipate uh, this shift from one trophic state to another trophic state, um, uh, roughly six months to one year ahead of actual event, okay? And they found that all, all of the indicators work pretty well. There was another study that looked at the you know, lake data, but on a much, much longer time scale, like 100 years. They again found the autocorrelation didn't work very well, but the variance and skewness works great. Okay, so now, now um, following this, you know, some of you who are really interested in applying these methods could actually read this paper in particular. This is more relevant for financial market data, not this one. Um, and we have a web page where I have already, I think, given link to, right? So you actually can download the package which I think all of you have done. So because, see, the analysis of time series also involves a lot of tricky statistical details. We did not want everyone to rediscover and rewrite their own codes. So therefore, there is this package which I think most of you have now downloaded and you can use it uh, efficiently. Um, and uh, okay, so now all this, uh, when, when I met Raghav sometime in the middle of all this, okay, 
and then uh, for a long time i had thought why don't people study this in financial systems he apparently had the same 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 uh, you know sort of amusement so we decided okay we should do something and one of the major, major motivations if you read any of these papers catastrophic transitions okay for them financial markets are like a you know classic example you know this is from the abstract of this paper uh, you know multi complex dynamic systems ranging from ecosystems to financial markets and the climate can have tipping points at which a sudden shift to a contrasting dynamical regime okay and that sort of motivates this paper where they review different early warning signals and how they you know what is the mathematical theory behind them and are they applicable in real world okay so this you know if you read any of these review articles on early warning signals and tipping points financial markets is some sort of a you know um, you know taken for granted that it's a it's an event like this but surprisingly no financial market data analysis was actually done of this type so me and raghav got together along with two undergraduate students and we decided to ask the following two questions are financial markets basically these critical transitions that happen at these bifurcation points okay so if that is true so we have these two predictions right so the market should exhibit increased variability prior to a crash okay and markets should show a critical slowing down which is same as increased autocorrelation at lag one okay so we asked whether these two are basically true in stock market data we did not worry about other indicators apart from these two there are you know there is skewness there is also um, a spectral function which i did not allow to describe to you and then there is one sub, one more thing called there are a couple of others which the early warning signal toolbox is all of them but we focused on these two because statistically these two are the easiest to measure compared to other you know for example skewness is third moment uh, for those who know statistics a little bit of statistics will know that uh, third and higher moments sort of very strongly depend on outliers okay so one has to be very careful while measuring them so we decided to focus on these two only okay so now instead of showing you what we found i would like you to find out what you will find using the package okay so hopefully so how many of you have a functional early warning package meaning you have you are able to install it so there is a cluster here which doesn't have a functional and how about this guys you guys all don't have it's not working fine so you should share you know find a nearest neighbor who has a functional you know laptop and just observe even if you cannot you know even if you cannot implement on your own okay so uh, first step you need to do is this you should go to the icts web page so go to the icts web page i will take you through the first few steps is everyone on the icts web page now so icts web page click on the uh, no, our school web page so come to this page i can increase the font size if it helps who is not on this page now that way i know whether to continue or not is anybody still not on this page okay everybody is on this page excellent okay um, so click on the preparatory and lecture materials and scroll down to number 8 8 d this part okay so download both of them so there is a okay i have wrongly labeled it as nasdaq data but actually is dow jones data okay so the 8d so you have uh, i have uploaded dow no data data set from nasdaq and sp500 download it in any folder of your choice on the computer but download both of them in the same folder so please download both of these on any folder oh i have it i have lecture 3 no shrikant look at this lecture 3 is there maybe the cash is it the one no okay
so has everyone downloaded so download them on create a new folder just to be clean um, and then uh, put both of these this r code and uh, dow jones data in the same folder okay now i have to find where is where are my my files no? and open the file in our studio once you have done that okay open the r file in our studio so put both of the files in in a, in, a, in the same directory and having done that um, open the r file in our studio so so you right click on the on the on the file and then you should see open with our studio as an option so i will wait for a few minutes to make sure everybody is with me there is only one no crash analysis one is the only one oh you can't don't don't open the excel file yeah i mean you can open if you want to see what's there but it's kind of pointless because we will uh, see that anyway everybody is there please open the r file so i'll wait for 1 minute to be sure oh this has not started so i have 1 hour 30 minutes now so i will just close it can you make it 1 hour whatever the you know up to 1 o'clock so is there anybody who has not reached the stage where you have not opened the r file okay yeah. no answer means everybody is here right okay okay great um so let's the so first thing you should do is go to se session session working directory set to source file location okay session working directory to source file location okay done excellent now we just run this line by line so first um, so there is a run that you see here so you point your mouse on the line the first line and then say run so it should load the early warnings package if we have properly installed it should happily load now what do you have oh did i upload a wrong file what's your first line did you have do you have a different file so show me what do you what's the car oh this is a different problem i want to see i want to see the r file oh no no i have done oh, unfortunately i have uploaded a wrong file okay i'm going to quickly replace the file okay so just delete because that file is just too complicated to follow okay you'll not be able to follow it but i don't need more than i'm going to delete that huh Sorry about the mess up. Um, so you have to wait for um, one and a half minutes for me to complete this. Okay, this one.
So if you now go to the same page, the, program, the preparatory and lecture materials, and refresh that page, okay? Refresh to make sure your cache is not there. You should have the right file. Exactly, yeah, it's called simple underscore code underscore crash analysis one. Sorry about that. Ah, now have you all opened the opened the file? Again, set the source file. You know, hmm? yeah, yeah. Go to session. Set the working directory to source file location. Yes, yes. Session. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody is on it now. Everybody is on, okay, great. So once you have done, um, load the library. So you have, you have this file, right? You don't have a different file. <laughs> which, uh, which option? You can't do this. You have to first open the file. So you have to open the file. Maybe can you work with your neighbor if you don't mind? Yeah. I will try to see after the you know after the today's lecture what to do. Okay. So uh, load the library and then load the data. So what this line is doing is uh, Okay, it, uh, there is a, you know, you have also downloaded a data file called dow underscore sp dot csv. Um, csv stands for comma separated values, okay. Uh, and, uh, and it down, you know, it basically whatever is in that file, it actually loads into a variable called d2, okay. So just say run, if, if it is in the same directory as your file is, it should be very happy. Just hold on for a second, I'm trying to see. Okay. So now what is in this D2, variable D2? To so know what is in the variable D2? Which step? This code, simple code anal crash analysis 1.r. Okay. Um, go to session, set working directory to source file location done and then click on the first line then click run you now click this something will happen and then the cursor come to the next line place it on the line dt equals to something run this again okay so everyone is now you have to now stop me if you are not with me okay i am assuming everyone has done d2 is equal to read csv Okay. Now to see what is in D2, come to the command line below. Type str D2. That shows the structure of this variable D2. Okay. So it basically shows you that this D2 has these many columns. So column number one is named year. Okay, it has data entries like this 26 5 1986, oh, sorry, 1896, 27 5 1896, and so on. Okay, the second column has a name DJI, 
and which has values 40.9, 40.6, this, this, this. Okay. So these were basically the value of Dow Jones index on 26.5.1896. So and the 40.6 was the value on 27.5.1896 and so on. And on those dates, SP500 had no values because that market did not exist then. Okay. And then ignore all these things, ignore the rest because we are only interested in first two columns. Okay. So it has all these um, some uh, number of columns. The most relevant ones to us are the year and the, uh, the DJI. Okay. So in the next two lines, it's only a formatting issue. So I would say don't worry about them, just run them. So go to the, this line, format the date and years properly and then run both the lines. Okay, don't do what they are doing. Yeah, yeah, separately on each, each of the lines. Done? So everyone has run those two lines. Now we just want to see how this time series looks like. Okay. Can you all can can you run this now? So go to the line number 12, which is on my this one, equivalent line number on yours, and say run. Oh. Okay, this are, happens for a stupid reason in R. Okay. So you just need to make the plot window somewhat big for that line line to function, otherwise it goes a bit crazy, huh? So this is the, so on the x-axis you have the, you know, date, y-axis you have the index over a period of time. Now we know where we got the background image for the conference, huh? Okay, so this has the full Dow Jones data for around last 120 years or so, 15 years or so. Uh, they can use this. Yeah, um, my voice, my voice sounds so different on this. <laughs> Either way, it's terrible, so it's okay. <laughs> Okay, so what do we want to do now, right? We want to now focus on one of the crashes. So we'll zoom into some parts where the crash actually happened. So which one do we want to look at? There are four major ones. Uh, 1929, 87, 2000, 2008, right? So that's what the rest of the code does. Um, so for example, in this line, you can choose the crash here you want to look at. So I have chosen 1929, let all of us do the same thing. So run that. Okay, now what the next line does is, so the thing is, you know, this data is a huge data that runs from uh, 1895, 96 to a few years ago, right? So I want to focus on only those values of Dow Jones index, um, and I want to plot only those values around 1929. So what I am now doing in the next couple of lines is I will extract the, you know, I'm going to extract the indices of the, you know, column rows, which actually fall four years before the crash year and one up to one year of the crash year. Okay. So this line, you know, if you're not very keen, don't worry how this actually functions. The main idea in this next four lines is trying to identify the time, you know, you know, four years around the 1929. Okay. That's what the next four lines do. So just execute them one by one. Okay, and if we have done that, and if you now plot, again it says margins are not happy. What happened? Ah, so look at this now. Now you have data, though, which are just around the 1929 crash, right? Okay. 
So now we would like to analyze these data. So what's, how do we analyze this data? How do we want to calculate, let us say, these two quantities. So the nice thing is the package will do all of it for you, but you just want to understand how it functions. Okay. What the package will do is it, it will take this data points as the input, okay, up to the crash date as the input. That will be the input. And then it first does the detrending. Okay, it basically, you know, as you can see, there are daily, day to day, day, large fluctuations in this data, right? What it does is it actually draws a smooth curve around them. And then from the original data, it subtracts the smooth curve. And then what do you get? You get residuals. And then once you have a residual, so imagine you have residuals now. This is time. So you have residuals. Right? This is a 1929 crash. So we want to calculate these as a function of time. But we have one time series. How do we do this? So if I take the entire window, I will get one value of covariance, right? I'll get one value of covariance at lag one and so on. So it's kind of pointless to do. So what we are really going to be doing is we'll take half of this. And then we will calculate what was the you know variance, you know covariance, you know autocorrelation at lag one, and, and a lot of these quantities, a whole bunch of quantities, QNS, something called spectral density ratio. It's going to show you a lot of things. We will focus on only two of them. Okay. Um, so for this window, which is half of the size we have plotted now, we will calculate each of those quantities, and then we will move this window by one day. So this was some day, this was, you know, basically one day. So we have a new window. Again, we will calculate these quantities. And then we will move this by another day. Again, calculate the same quantities. As a consequence, you will have many of these indicators as a function of time. Is the idea clear? Okay, so this is, I mean, you know, the photos have again done time series analysis. It's called moving window analysis. Okay. So, how do you use the package? Okay. Um, so, this is the command you need to use. Okay, I can, I'm just going to make it full screen. So, the function is called generic underscore EWS. How did I instantaneously write that? You just type it. <laughs> no, 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 uh, yeah, write BW25. Okay, and that's actually, you don't have to write that also, it's okay. Um, yeah, do write BW equal to 25. I will explain what is BW later on. And, but the next, this is the most crucial thing. Generic, you have to type this. Yeah, actually, I did have a different file. You know, I was I moved from one to two. <laughs> so basic idea is that you know the D two dollar DJI has all of the indices of Dow Jones from eighteen ninety six to now, but I am only using the indices pre crash. I'm not using all the indices. I'm only using the indices pre crash. Huh? Uh, I don't think it's of interest to this workshop. So I don't want. There are many ways you get the smooth curve. And the Gaussian is one method. There's a box kernel. You basically have a set of data points. You use a kernel to smoothen the data. Huh? Oh, is it? Oh, OK. I can. But the results really don't change.
it's basically some filtering basically filtering also yeah retraining is basically filtering you just basically imagine that the seasonality right yeah, yeah 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 so let me know if all of you are done with this so one simple way to understand detrending what exactly is detrending is that imagine you are plotting the number of uh, you know uh, imagine you are looking at the data of a shopkeeper and you are looking at how much money he made as a function of time okay okay now if you plot for year 2014 and 15 do you think there will be some common commonality in them you know how much money he made every day as a function of time for 2014 13 12 15 ha huh? there will be seasonal there will be some very strong seasonal components near some festivals there will be some strong peaks other times when there are no festivals no holidays there will be a, you know relatively low sales right now the point is that those can sometimes unnecessarily confound your analysis so there are these very well defined trends that happen for an external reason that have nothing to do with the actual market dynamics so you want to eliminate them that's what the detrending does so basic idea is that when you are doing linear stability analysis you look at the variation around the equilibrium right okay that's what in some sense detrending is all about so you look at the broad trend we assume that the broad trend happens for some damn stupid reasons like seasonality and other things uh, but i am what what really captures dynamics is the variations around the trend okay that's the internal dynamics of the system so you eliminate those and that's what the detrending does there are a bunch of methods some kind of linear methods some basically i, will, I, mean, I don't want to go into it. detrending is basically a bunch of data points you fit a kernel to it you know smooth on that by using a gaussian kernel or you know uniform distribution kernel or linear in many ways i am also not an expert on that but you know you can read up if you are interested okay and then when you are detrending you need a parameter called bandwidth okay okay that's what i am doing there and the window size what is window size i mentioned to you that this is the okay this is becoming really messy right so i'm going to so this is the full index okay and you want to calculate the indicator okay and what do you do you 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 create a rolling window right so win size tells you if the total length of this is l you know what fraction of it you know what percentage of l should the rolling window be if the if i have said the win size to be 40 Forty percent of this length will be used for the rolling window analysis. Okay, so as of now we have chosen a four-year-long window. Forty percent would be roughly around one point eight years or so. I mean, you can change that. You know, that's the whole point. I think you should change for both the BW and this uh, win size to see how the results are sensitive to these parameter values. Okay, is everything fine so far? We just now. if you have input this line clearly just execute this one second oh it's asking for extra packages install them oh one second one second i think my case my problem is a bit different here let me fix my problem oh, okay 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 so for me it works fine so at least you can see this is how it out you know uh, even if it doesn't work for you um this is what it is doing i will explain this um so that's the first you know the, the that's the raw data the top figure there where is the pointer so top figure is this so ignore this ignore this ignore this ignore this and ignore this ignore this entire things okay ignore this entire panel this 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 stuff this is the black line is the raw data the red one is the detrended data okay and that the way you get this red line will depend on the bw you choose if you have 
yeah that's a trend yeah so that's a trend and residuals are the detrended data so look at the residuals it's kind of very very clear at least about one thing the residuals are increasing with time Thousand. So now thousand actually corresponds to the day before the actual crash. You haven't seen the crash here in this data. Yes, yes, yes. So on this day, the next day, there is a some twenty percent drop. Yeah, yeah. Here, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, exactly. There is a increase in strength of clustering. that's the variance but the increasing clustering should be captured by auto correlation if that is true right if there is a real clustering so these so is everyone with me so far on this i'll just uh, guide you through this so ignore this uh, after the residuals ignore all of this okay and ignore this as well so look at only ar1 which is a measure of the you know um uh, the return rate so this is actually the return rate directly So in fact, maybe look at the return rate. You know, look at return rate is fluctuating, uh, and it sort of reduces a bit. Actually, what's what's the prediction of the theory? By the way, return rate should go to zero, close to zero. As a consequence, you should find that the auto correlation should increase, and as a consequence, the variance should increase. So what's very very clear here is the variance is very nicely increasing before the crash. Okay. Ah, uh, it is increasing from the two hundred days before, roughly an year, roughly one year, because two fifty days is the number of business days in an year. So two hundred days is roughly an year. Okay, that is increasing. But if you look at the auto correlation, it is increasing, but the strength is really weak. Okay, this candle tau measures how strong the increasing or decreasing trend is. So a value close to one means it's a very strongly increasing trend. A value smaller is actually not a very strong trend. So the figures you should focus on are actually this one and this one, okay, and these two, of course. These are the real data. These are the indicators: um, AR one and the standard deviation. Okay. Did you input a different value of BW and RW? I mean, you know, wind wind size and uh, bandwidth. Ah, huh? how is that possible? <laughs> That's just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's it looks different. Ah, uh, you're right. You're right. Can you show your uh, code? Ah, uh, pre-crash, wind size forty. Nineteen twenty-nine. That's really bizarre. I have no idea why. <laughs> <laughs> you also have a similar graph, sir. <laughs> no, let's compare the values here. No, what about these values? Even those are different. Yes, yes. Maybe, maybe. Uh -huh. Even I haven't. Uh... Yeah, there is something different about the bandwidth parameter. No, yeah, I don't know what is the difference, but there is some difference for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's close enough, I guess. You know, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess there might be some parameter value different. You know, when I have sent the code to you, because I'm actually using a slightly different code now. I'm using the you know, uh, two, right? Maybe there is some difference in the way I implemented things. Mm. But it all looks exactly same. Uh, So maybe you can t try to do the following. Can we check the indices if our indices are same? Indices. Can you check the last index? What is the last index? Just type indices under underscore pre crash on your command prompt. Huh? No, no, don't look at these numbers. Don't look at these numbers. Oh, you don't have thousand elements. It must be same. 
So this is 997, 8, 999,000. So is your index number correct? Do you all end with 8248? So if all of you who end with 8248 should have the same results as me. Even though you are ending with the same index. Okay, let's check the next thing. What's the next thing that can happen? Let's look at D, D2, DJI. Uh, in, input the last index, 8248. It's 381.1, so that's my last index. What is your last index? Same? But you still have same different results. How is it possible? Maybe you're using different, <laughs> I don't know. But still, it should not be say, math, mathematics. No, it's not social science. I mean, at least this part is not social science. <laughs> Very different. Okay. okay, I'll just try to run again, maybe. Oh, now obviously I had a different data set. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, now, so two things are clear. One thing that's okay, one thing that's very, very clear is that standard deviation of the variance is behaving as expected from the theoretical predictions. That you cannot say so confidently for the autocorrelation, right? Correlation at lag one. That's the, um, you know, second figure on the row, second row, left column. This one. Actually, this, 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 they all capture, these four capture same information. That is why I said focus on one of them. Okay. Uh, so this does not, this should have increased as you approach the crash, but that is not very clearly happening. You can always suspect that maybe that, you know, we have chosen two parameter values, right? That wind size and bandwidth. So maybe these results are spurious, we don't know. So one thing we did in these calculations was that was to vary those parameters, you know, by a law by a massive range, and then what we did was we. So all of you know what is a Kendall tau correlation? Huh? Kendall tau correlation basically captures the trend of a series. If it is continuous, you know, if it's monotonically increasing, you'll have a value of one. If it is monotonically decreasing, you'll have a value of minus one. If it is noisy. It will have something in between. If it is, if it has no trend, it will be zero. Okay, and uh, no trend means basically zero. Okay, so larger the trend you have, better the results are. Okay, that's what we did, and then I will show you the results uh, we got. Okay, but what we do find very very consistently is that these Kendall tows are actually even larger than this. Sometimes it's like point nine, point, you know, nine five. Sometimes even one. Whereas this one, I will show you the results very shortly. They're actually very different. Okay. So what I will now do, now that you have played around a bit, I'll just show you what results we got. Okay. So you can also do this, by the way. So can you go to this web page? Can you all see this? Should I increase the font size? Oh, that only increases the. So I will just. If you don't see, I can uh, write it. This URL. I O. EWS Finance, yes. I hope it doesn't crash if all of you open at the same time. <laughs> well, hopefully, no. Hopefully, the IO uh, is not so bad. <laughs> um, what? You got it? Who hasn't gotten so far? Can you? I'll wait for one more second. Oh, sorry, 10 more seconds. <laughs> I know. 
So it's guttal.shinyapps.io, G-U-T-T-A-L dot shinyapps.io slash EWS finance. So, Shikant, were you able to get on it? How about people there who were not able to get on it? HTTPS is not required. It automatically comes. It automatically deciphers the, what is the protocol. Okay, no. Everyone, uh, the group there, are you guys able to find it? How about the top pros? The topmost row there? Done? Okay. I mean, uh, if you're unable to get, so what I have, what you should do is go to the historical meltdowns, click on the historical meltdowns here. From on the same page, click on the historical meltdowns. There's a tab there. Click on the historical meltdowns, zoom in a bit. So there are various sub tabs there, you know, stay on the default tab. So what you're seeing there is the Dow Jones data as a function of time, that's the topmost plot. The four boxes represent the four crashes and the zoomed in versions basically show the analysis for each of them, okay? The first one is the 1929 crash, okay? So the same data you saw on your, this one, okay? And then you find the residuals. We already know the method now. You find the rolling window, and then you find autocorrelation at lag one and the variance. And power spectrum is another way of measuring variance, so don't worry about it. Focus only on these two. But, and then the second column is the 1987 crash, and then you have 2000 crash, 2008 crash. What's very clear in all of it is that there is no ambiguity about variance very clearly increasing before each of the crashes, right? So one of the predictions seems to be doing really well. However, the other prediction about autocorrelation is very, is unreliable, right? So sometimes it's increasing, decreasing, noisy, maybe decreasing, increasing, decreasing. So there is no consistency across the crashes, but if you look at each of the crash and if you do a large parameter scans and you know you obtain how how reliable your results are, if you zoom in a bit more, we have also turned on various p-values here. So the p-values are basically obtained from different types of null models. Again, independent of what kind of null model you use, the results of variance are very, very good, you know, with p-values less than 10 to the minus three in most cases. Whereas for the autocorrelation, you know, it's really not good enough. Okay, all of you know, I hope, what is the p-value? You would have learned something in statistics, right? Okay, so p-value basically is the, you know, chance of getting the same results with a random data. So I haven't described to you how we get these p-values. You should read the paper for more details. Okay, um, so these are the clear sort of results. You know, one of the prediction works great, the other prediction doesn't seem to be true. And if you think this might be an artifact of Dow Jones, go to SP500. So go, go, to, go to the top page. There is a you know um, tab called SP500. Look at what's happening for the SP500, okay? So we don't have a 1929 crash for SP500. Why did we, do, why did we not include? Because the data was too close, yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't have background data, okay? Yeah, so we did not do that. Again, sort of exactly same results. Again, if you think it's similar results, again, look at what's happening for NASDAQ, exactly same. Autocorrelation is no clear trends, but the variance has very clear trends before the crash. And these are, this is a, these are two European markets. One is a German market, other one is a, I think UK they again show exactly same results. Okay, so this is German 2000, German 2008, UK 2000, UK 2008. Okay, 
in all of them variance is very strikingly increasing but the auto correlation is very noisy and not significant even whatever the results we have whatever the trend we find is not a statistically significant result okay of the return rate or oh, because they are mirror images of each other mathematically <laughs> hmm yeah 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 so, so um well i will give you a very very quick you know half a minute explanation for that uh what is the relationship between ar1 and return rate is it correct mm uh hmm -huh. uh uh what is a mirror yeah it is not that's the whole point you're right so this prediction seems to be right this prediction does not seem to be right in the real data i'm not saying both are correct by the way just to clarify i'm only saying one of the prediction is found in the real data but not the other one okay um this is you know based on real data analysis so in every one of them increasing trends in variance is very very clear not so for the correlation at lag 1 or covariance at lag 1 okay is it clear to everyone so it means the theoretical results are only half true as of now you know only half of them are right the other half is not so how do we understand it is the next question okay um but at least is this part clear to everyone the entire method of analysis the theory meth analysis and the results of real data hmm? uh no 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 it doesn't no any other questions that's a yeah i mean um i can show you a graph which i don't have immediate access to right now um so what we do to address that question is for every pair of this bandwidth and the rolling window we choose we calculate the kendall tau coefficient and then we choose roughly 10 around around a million parameter combinations okay and then you plot the histogram of this kendall tau uh -huh. and this is the frequency and then what we do is this frequency will range from minus 1 to 1 no the values then what we do is we look at if if this if the results are something like this or something like this that means i accidentally found a very high value by choosing an appropriate you know very convenient parameter value right so what we did was we said that a trend is really significant only if data looks something like this you know a large number of values are actually close to one means there is a clear increasing trend okay so those graphs are there but not in this right now i can show you those graph if you are interested yeah one of you yeah shrikant yeah yeah so there are this four years of before the crash data yeah 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 and your window size is fairly large here yes yes right? two, two years i think yeah two year yeah. so would you think so we have you a two have year like window of the two years i mean so that even if you are just a day before the crash uh -huh. you are included data which is like going back yeah. two years Only or maybe years. even several i mean so if you look at like four months or six months before the crash it's not clear whether that data would have any information so it's not like underestimating these uh, effects that is one question so probably would it make sense to have much smaller windows So would mean that you have less number of data points, right? Right. But then this is like averaging out, so you are like probably underestimating the simply true uh, the thing. It's possible. So maybe some sort of a weighted mean or averaging would probably it's be possible. So that is one question. The yeah. other is like I'm still theoretically trying to understand this connection between this variance function mm -hmm. and what wh whether why you should expect the variance here to increase. Now, if you observe from that original model. right so if the return yeah. rate goes to zero yeah 
you return to a brownian motion yes exactly yeah brownian motion or your white noise mm-hmm. has basically variance 1 exactly. or sigma square yeah 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 what variance is infinite only when t is so these are formulas when t has already been sent to infinity absolutely true yes so i don't see the connection as to so when you are sending the return rate to zero also mm-hmm. the instantaneous variance uh, why it is no, so i'm increasing is not co- i don't see how it is correlated with this uh, formula so you don't have to diverge you can still have an increasing but no the but if you look at if you take r to zero you have a brownian motion in the limit yeah. brownian motion is a stationary process no variance there is no problem with it but the point is if you go from an ou to a brownian motion all else being equal the variance will increase variance of what whatever the inst- you choose some duration over which will measure the variation ah, variance increase huh that's all i'm trying to say as you go from an ou to a brownian motion for any all else being equal whatever the window you are measuring your instantaneous or over realization right. or over some right. window but whatever uh, it is all of those quantities will increase as you just change go from a ou to a brownian motion that 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 is clear because uh, you don't have any mean reversion now your exactly. mean reversion is becoming weaker exactly. and weaker exactly. so you are increasing exactly yeah. but this one over r is somewhat that's why it's a little misleading because you would expect it to blow up or something that yes, won't happen. that happens only in physics models so it doesn't happen in yeah, yeah, yeah. dynamic system so, models yeah because see there some time scale has to come in because when you are yeah, saying yeah, the yeah, variance goes true. to infinity yeah. means it's only after infinite time so so it's not divergence it's only yeah, so, you know um, so, oh if you get a divergence uh, in some you know basically in physical systems you do get a real divergence because you have an extent in space which is infinitely large Ah. that doesn't happen here you have only 1 degree of freedom there there you have infinite degrees of freedom okay, okay? So that, i mean effect 10 to the power of 323 mar- particles right so all of them having an x dot varying something like this with some coupling so there you do get a real divergence so you don't technically it's not a real divergence right so uh, from that point of view so variance should increase so it is not yeah. clear why auto correlation at lag 1 should uh, somehow uh, so lag one is basically setting t minus t prime to the lowest possible unit i can measure right so that also will increase no but if you look at the, your brownian motion if uh-huh. you look at these changes over time period one if i am thinking uh-huh. correctly uh-huh. they are uncorrelated uh so if your r is going to zero this should go uh-huh. to zero not blow up uh right 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 so that's a that's a counterintuitive part i mentioned so when you have uh um um so yeah i don't know how to explain that very well actually uh intuitively i don't it's a bit hard to explain but it's easy to explain in this potential context imagine there's a perturbation because the system takes longer to come back right okay okay so the increments are independent in the brownian motion so what i am really looking at is the actual positions uh, actual. yes so because the return rate is now longer system is more likely to be like itself uh, like itself of the previous time step i see but you are looking at the in the returns right exactly, the returns yeah. of your uh, time series exactly exactly yeah 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 so you basically ret- if you look at this potential you know if you think of being perturbed yeah now because of longer return times it wanders off you know uh, for longer time meaning uh so if it is kicked this way it's going to take longer to come back to its original you know equilibrium and then kicked off again so there is a memory in the system that increases so memory is in the absolute value not in the increments increments will still be random though i like can brown in motion yeah it's basically measuring at you know in the limit of brown in motion i'm actually measuring wt square sort of you know which will you know that variance is actually inf- infinity right technically for t goes to um pretty large uh, yeah. once i had a question abhishek oh, uh, he had a question sorry yeah yeah it's mesh so yeah. Uh, yeah so thing is if you look at actually the 1925 cra- uh, this one uh, 28 crash 29 Uh, 29 crash okay that was actually very like a very small crash right i mean if you look at the size of it the numerically it was small for today's standards but for then it was a massive it was high so so the point is you see actually similar drops or in fact larger drops occurring at like various points of intervals like you know if you go today of 300 and all is like nothing like nothing right i mean yeah. similarly yeah. we we did trend no so the that part is taken of absolute numbers are sort of not important in the mean sense in the variance sense also i'm looking at the increase in variance not the absolute value of variance i won't compare the variance today to variance in 1929 i'm going to compare variance today and day, day before yesterday yeah. yeah 
so the second is basically to check for false alarms in it yeah. i mean like yeah. there method to check for that so the all these p values do that those do, do those things they are all basically ways to check for false alarms so for example how much time do we have only 12 minutes what's the time now actual time uh, 43 1243 or 15 minutes okay i have three more minutes than this okay <laughs> um so so he is asking a question how do we know that these trends could have occurred by chance alone is it your question can i rephrase your question that way huh? so so what do you think will be a method to do that so you have a where you know sequence of stock indices right now we want to know the specific trend of let's say increasing variance is actually a true signature now one way there are many ways to work around this problem you know to address this question one simple way is a boot bootstrapping so i have a sequence of dji over time but uh, and it showed a increasing variance okay it had the strength of increasing variance okay the strength is given by the kendall tau right now imagine that i just shuffle the data randomly now okay and i get a new time series but it has no real meaning right it's just a sequence of same numbers but just you know ordered in some random ways now i can again do the same rolling window calculations i can again calculate the variance i can again calculate how strong was the trend by kendall tau right so i get one value of kendall tau from a randomized data i just do the bootstrapping again i get one more kendall tau and then i get a basically if i repeat this large number of times let's say 1000 times okay i get a histogram of kendall tau from randomized data sets what this p boot tells you is that in how many of those instances of randomized data was the kendall tau more than 0.977 for example of the observed data so specifically i was so i was referring to this figure so the k tau for the you know um for the data real data was 0.977 and then you do this randomizing lot of the times and you find kendall tau 1000 times and it turns out that none of them had as high of a kendall tau as the real data whereas look at the look at um uh, look at uh, auto correlation at lag 1 the strength had 0.947 p boot is 0.77 meaning 70% of the times you got comparable numbers of strength of signals in the random data which means that this trend of 0.47 minus 47 which is a decreasing trend was just totally not reliable by any means even the random data would have given you those kind of numbers okay so that's one method there are three other methods we used par1 and you know and also something called a spectral method so i'm happy to explain that to you in detail you know that's the idea basic idea okay in every one of them you preserve some property of the time series and you randomize the others that's a bit you know for example in the p boot you preserve the actual data points you randomize the order in the ar1 you 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 preserve the auto correlation but you randomize the you generate a new time series and in the p spec you preserve the overall spectral properties but generate new series okay these are the different methods of doing the same huh uh huh uh huh uh huh uh huh uh okay yeah 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 i understand what you're saying yeah yeah that's a great question so i will actually we actually have the exact same as a figure in the data by the way in the, in the paper i don't know where it is though but before i before i go to your question which i can we can discuss separately what you can also do is you can look at the current trends here oh i have to read or read out this So on the same website, it's not actually very user friendly now. You know, it's just functional. So you can choose any index you want. Um, it automatically generates the current trends. Oh yeah, see, look. So so we are still still trying to sort of you know add a box here which tells what is the current trend. You know how good was it in comparison to this. So you can choose any. I think they we even have, you know. Uh, So this was all done by um, Nikunj Goel, who was a uh, UG student at IASC. Okay, some Colombo. Okay, so you can choose that it automatically generates. You know, Colombo is safe. You know, the variance is not really increasing. Okay, whereas you know, I think SP five hundred was pretty bad as of today. You can also choose Bombay Stock Exchange. I don't know how it is. I think it has high volatility. Yeah, so it has a pretty high value of you know, it has a pretty strong increasing trend. Uh, and then you can also do one more thing. You can actually choose this bandwidth rolling window and all these things yourself. You can also choose an exact date you would like to analyze. You can also go back in time. 
you know so 2010 well, how was it in 2010 march okay and then you can vary the parameter values here you know and then it immediately generates these plots for you okay um so if you have any suggestions on how to improve this you know i would be very happy to in incorporate them um but anyway so now i want to finish this and go back to my presentation absolutely absolutely yes 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 okay so i want to sort of now sort of um go back to my slides we did this right you know i showed you all this okay and you know the main result from our study was that there is no critical slowing down because the autocorrelation did not show any significant trends but there was a high variability prior to all the meltdowns that we measured okay and then um so statistical significance i have just mentioned to you okay so how do we explain this lack of critical slowing down with rising variability is is an obvious follow up question okay so only one of the predictions of the theory is correct the other is not correct so we have a hypothesis i don't think it's i don't know if it's correct but you know we have a hypothesis so so all this theoretical framework basically is about a system undergoing a transition at this bifurcation point right so all of this assume that so at this bifurcation point you have a transition and then you expect these properties however i also described to you very briefly about something called stochastic transitions where you can actually have a transition even much before the bifurcation point okay now why do why do those kind of transitions happens because the stochastic fluctuations are large whenever that happens whenever the strength of stochastic fluctuations increase you can have a transition even when you are away from a critical point kind of fairly straight forward and obvious but what would trends look like if it, that was the case so in this in these two graphs what we show so this is an example of a critical transition you simulate this model uh, and then you find this abrupt change and you measure autocorrelation it increases variance increases however if you take a stochastic transition and it undergoes a collapse what we find is autocorrelation theoretically is not expected to change at all whereas the variance does indeed change okay so since this was indeed the result that we found the autocorrelation had no trends but the variance has strong trends maybe the financial meltdowns are not really like critical transitions that happen at the bifurcation point rather they are more likely stochastic transitions that happen away from a critical away from a bifurcation point but because of large amount of stochasticity okay that's the hypothesis we propose in this paper and uh, you know financial meltdowns are actually not critical you know critical transitions i don't know if people will like this idea <laughs> they like this result <laughs> okay uh, these are actually better explained by stochastic transitions and uh, and and every one of the crash was you know preceded by a strong increasing trend of variability which is similar to what people know in terms of volatility which is exactly not the same as volatility it's a bit different you know the way you calculate is a bit different okay and uh, uh, we discuss that in the paper how are the different uh, briefly and therefore this could be an early warning signal it doesn't eliminate false alarms but it does provide some information okay and uh, we have quite a bit of discussion on you know uh, false alarms per se okay but i think with that um i'll finish my talk before 3 minutes of time okay so we can just discuss now and then i think we don't need an afternoon session i think we're done finished Everyone is convinced. Yes, great. So all of you do know about volatility, right? You have heard about volatility a lot more than variance, uh, in in the context of financial series. So I also don't have a very good understanding, but I have very basic understanding. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Uh mhm. -huh. Mm mhm. Mm
maybe you can discuss this after the yeah i think it's a great question but uh, maybe it's not easy to answer <laughs> Two hundred points. Two hundred days. Uh huh. Two hundred days before, what do you have? 
chosen, you have chosen around 1000 days. If I just take 200 days, I won't find anything. So what is the optimal kind of past in which you should look to find a kind of this kind of transition? Um, so all of, I don't know how many, so if you have a stock index, um, you know, x1, x2, xn, first you kind the return rate, let's call that, you know, p, okay? I think that is logarithm of xt plus 1 over xt, right? Huh? And then you calculate the variance of pt, that's the volatility, you know, variance. Whereas what we are doing, we, we directly take this data, we detrend it, and then uh, take the variance. So whereas what they do is they take the logarithm of the yeah daily ratio, no ratio to ratio, and then and then if uh, t's are very close, you can actually approximate this by x t plus one minus x t by x t. And then, so basically, you're looking at a new quantity, which is the difference um, relative to the current value. And what is the variability in that over time? That's the volatility. I mean, this is people then, some people do a variance, some people do a magnitude instead of the variance. So it's a small difference in the way you calculate volatility. But uh, it roughly captures this. No, in fact, uh, it has been a pleasure being here for all these days and we were, as students, we were across generations and as teachers also we found that they were across generations and it was great and it was, uh, though some of us were at uh, part of CSP when Professor Badri was a student there, uh, I think Srinivas gave a great gift to us uh, to take us back to those 20 years back when they taught us in masters. That in itself was the greatest gift which you could give, apart from which we had excellent uh, lectures by Dr. Srikant Iyer or Vishesh, Vishweshar Guttel, if I pronounce him right. And I'm extremely happy that uh, we had a very great time. And of course, uh, all these things would not have happened, uh, but for Dr. Uh, Srinivas Raghavendra and in fact to speak of this conference without speaking about Dr. Srinivas would be like saying about uh, Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. I think we should give a great round of applause for Dr. Srinivas Raghavendra. <laughs> and also all our cycling expeditions as well as the lectures will hold us uh, fond memories of this great place. Uh, I, I am grateful, extremely grateful and thankful for the organizers. All okay. Hey, <clears throat> thanks. You're very kind. Very kind. Thank you. I think 
it's not uh, it's not fair to say that it's me and all it's the three of us uh, vishu shrikant <laughs> but uh, no we started thinking about this you know last year we, we were working very seriously on various issues and discussion various discussions we thought it'd be very interesting to put together such a program and we didn't expect the amount of kind of reception that we got from so many applications from all over india we were just overwhelmed because i was in ireland and uh, they were they were in bangalore so somehow coordinated selecting candidates and you know we were but it's been a wonderful experience i really hope that you know we try to br- bring together two different strands one is the substantive you know issues in terms of money role of money in macroeconomics this has been a contentious issue and people have been working all over in all over the world on various topics in this topic in various different directions and that is one and in that you have this challenge of of understanding how the real economies work so some kind of generative principles in terms of can we understand modern uh, market economies in that context and this is in that sense both substantive and methodological you know uh, points come together so that is the challenge i mean i've studied in india you know in economics training i know I, i've taught in india so i understand a little bit of you know challenges that we have in terms of teaching as well as i thought it'll be uh, this one went quite well i hope you will carry this spirit forward not just you know okay after this okay these guys talked something and okay fine brownian motion whatever <laughs> eto calculus whatever but no i think if you try to implement it you know in your in your small ways in your phd or you know spread the word around and uh, it'll be great to see you know if this momentum can be sustained and it is basically without it has to be a demand led you know uh, movement it can't have supply driven uh, you know change in this kind of uh, so i hope you will continue the spirit of inquiry in this mode not just you know go back to macroeconomics or traditional ways of thinking as keynes would say we want to get out of this habitual modes of thinking so i also want to thank uh, petri purainen um, you know <laughs> gary demsky uh, yeah genaro zetza all of them you know when i spoke to them a year ago uh, i said they were very kind to agree immediately i mean they didn't even petri you know coming all the way during christmas it's a, it's a big deal Uh, christmas and new year and he was teaching on the first you're sulking oh you know. <laughs> so also thank you all i mean you made it very very lively and you know enjoyable to teach it's not it's not like we were teaching you it's it's also we were learning while we are we were teaching i mean when you actually talk to outside economics that's where you actually explain you understand it better if you talk to your own fellows in economics departments you tend to take them for granted and you draw curves without any labels and so on which srikanth hates it <laughs> where is x axis <laughs> what do you mean by x axis i think it's been great and we can't say in any other way but it's been fantastic great and thank you i hope we'll continue thanks to the yeah thanks <laughs> and we also thank icts all the support staff shantan sashi kiran shantaraj everybody and uh, everybody connected to this yeah i know they last holidays because of us i mean 25th they were here and you know all yeah so please keep this in mind and it's been <laughs> so whatever you can do in terms of blogging in terms of networking in terms of creating getting taking this momentum forward is in your hands and hope we we can meet again yeah we should start with the literature and the direction in which it is going i mean the audience had been absolutely fantastic given the kind of background uh, with which you are coming from so many diverse backgrounds and yet the question and the interaction was i mean i was really worried uh, knowing how some of these sessions where you have a lot of students they go and you are bringing in something completely different i mean the discussion sessions i was worried always i was telling raga like you know we need to plan for the discussion sessions i mean what's going to happen i mean typically you don't see that many questions and so the questions were really fabulous 
And we also enjoyed this whole time. I was thinking that there would be an exponential drop in the number of people who are going to come into this room. Uh, but that didn't happen. We really had a full house. And we would like to get some good feedback on uh, how this thing can be. See, this was the first attempt. So it was completely, it could be in some sense, maybe all over the place, maybe in terms of, because the speakers also were not sure what kind of audience we would have and what background they will have and things like that. So if uh, we want to do this again, maybe in a more focused way, more concentrated, like um, a discussion meeting or something like that, uh, it could be planned much in advance and where uh, you would also come more prepared and uh, we can have a more focused series of like, you know, we can just start with some problems, just, like you know go deeper into some of building these models or something like that maybe that we can we can probably think or explore uh, something in that direction okay thanks thanks